Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Shift with Gina. I'm so happy to be back here with you guys. It's been a while since we've had a guest. The last couple episodes have been just solo episodes about some of the viral TikToks we've seen online about marriage, motherhood, birth control, misinformation, etc. But today we have a really great guest in studio. My last guest was virtual um, Katie Faust to talk about the human rights issue of surrogacy that's ha- happening in our country, which is a great episode if you guys haven't seen that yet. Um, but today we have a really, really great guest in studio. But before I introduce her, I do want to tell you guys about our sponsor today. Um, Charlie Skincare has been one of my favorite sponsors, probably my number one favorite sponsor these days because this, this is what I sound. You hear? I love that sound. The Italian glass. One of the things I love about Charlize is that she puts all of her products in Italian glass, which is really important to avoid endocrine disruptors that come from the plastic that a lot of our skincare products are in. And one of the things that is great is she takes so much care in the quality of ingredients that are in her products. Um, I love this daily moisturizer. I used to avoid pretty much all moisturizers for a long time until I found this one. Um, And I like to put this under makeup in the morning and she's got a really great facial cleanser. She's got some nice serums, a really nice orange blossom body lotion. Um, So if you would like to try her products, my code gives you 20% off. If you go to her website, you can click the link in the description and just use the code Gina, G-I-N-A. That gives you 20% off. And I think you guys are gonna love her products. And our guest today, Landon Starbuck, is also familiar with Charlie's skincare. For my birthday last year, you gave me a really nice kit. Yes, I mean, they're the best skincare. products on the market. And I love that they're USA made, made by patriots who are very yes. like health conscious. Like yeah. these people, if you know anything about their history, like care very deeply about people's health and how it, the ramifications of, you know, causing cancer and endocrine disruptors and all these other issues that they went and made these products um, that you can literally feel the difference on yeah. your skin. I, I used to break out and everything had to be kind of piecemeal. Like I can use this face wash from this company, this thing. Right. I literally just use their entire line because it's so clean. It feels so great. I do not break out. And people ask me, oh, you have nice skin. I'm like, this stu- it's this stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. With, and I was telling you before we started recording that in that kit you gave me for my birthday last year, there's this tinted moisturizer that I love. It's SPF 25 and it's the perfect tint. And I was using it all during the fall and the summer last year because it was just like the perfect thing to put on in the morning if you don't want to put on full makeup so she's got really great products and it's true it is one of those like one-stop shop right for just really good skincare all around right yeah i wasn't expecting like i love all of the products i mean yeah. even they're like the lotion the orange cream one is smells amazing yeah yeah and it just feels good to replace all the other garbage that we were using before it does. You yeah know? and it's a win-win because you know voting with our dollar is so important now yeah. and it's hard to find companies these days that that match our values yes. and that don't hate us because mm-hmm. I feel like there are so many companies that honestly just hate us yeah. and what we believe. Right. And we're giving them our money. Yes. And we give them our yeah. money. And we will talk about that a little bit today. But first, why don't you introduce yourself? I mean, to me, you're many things. You're a friend and you're a great mom. You're a filmmaker. You're a musician. You're a commentator. You have a wonderful nonprofit. But uh, why don't you tell everybody what you do, if you can kind of summarize it? Because you have been on my show before, but I think it's been a while. So tell yeah. people who you are. So I'm Landon Starbuck. I'm a mom. Um, I run a nonprofit combating child exploitation called Freedom Forever. Um, I'm also a filmmaker. I just released uh, The War on Children with my husband. It's been an amazing uh, experience to see how many people have watched this film just as an independent, you know, small group that we are putting this out and getting over 50 million people downloading it Gosh. and no ad spend. Like wow. we didn't spend any money promoting it because we couldn't because we were canceled through all these platforms that wouldn't allow us to promote our film. Yeah. It's been amazing to, to just go on that journey. So to continue being able to uh, be a creative and um, I came from the industry as a billboard charting artist, and I left because of the exploitation there that is now being so revealed um, and highlighted, which is awesome. I think there's so much more that, that we can uncover there, and perhaps that's, you know, a future film that we might make. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been awesome to take those gifts and use them for this film and just get to uh, use our creativity for a good cause and to help protect children because that's something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, yeah. And I've always seen that in your work. Even before we met, I always saw that you and your husband, Robbie, are very passionate about protecting children. And I see it in the way that you raise your own three children. Um, I Last time we 
we did a podcast together. I was also saying a few things about how your oldest Scarlett is like, she maintains that innocence. She's a teenager, but she looks her age. And it's so sad today when I see a lot of teenagers, whether they're kids I see online or friends, daughters, they dress and act and look like they're 30 years old. And these are like 15 year old girls who should be enjoying their innocence, their childhood, and enjoying those years that they're never, ever going to get back. Because when we were kids, it was much more common for girls to look their age. Right. You know, of course, I'm sure that there were parents back then, too, that were kind of pushing more mature things on their teenage girls. But today, it's hard to find girls who are really innocent and who act their age. So I've always loved that about you and Robbie. You know, it's it's such a priority now, especially how dangerous things are getting online mm -hmm. and the things that we're bombarded with in our culture. Um, I watched The War on Children when it first was released on X. Feels weird to call it that. I still call it Twitter. I know. I do too. I'm like, <laughs> ah. Weird. But it was available on X for a couple weeks before you guys put it behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I watched it and we were just, we, we knew it was going to be good, but we were shocked at how much information was in there that is so useful to parents today. Um, I know it was a really big project for you guys. And how did you narrow it down to what subjects you were going to cover because you could make a documentary that's like five, six hours about this topic. Right. But how did you guys decide on what was going to be put into this film? Right. That was the hardest part about making this film is, you know, it's a long film. Um, and it was, you know, identifying every aspect of the war on children. I mean, how can we talk about just the education and, and negate the Hollywood aspect, the entertainment world? And how can we forget about the medicalization of children? Yeah. It was it was really um, an intentional thing to make sure we covered every aspect of the war on children. So parents are especially equipped to identify those threats to their kids and make different choices. Um, if you don't know things are happening, there's really little you can do about it. You're in a reactive state after things happen. Um, so we really wanted to make sure parents knew every aspect of this, how it's targeting kids, how they're working synergistically to go after our children mm. and what can be done about it. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the first things that you talk about in the film is the mere exposure effect. And I think this is something that's really important for everyone, parents especially, to understand. It's they start to very slowly introduce you to concepts. And I actually think about this in terms of anything in our culture. Let's take abortion, for example. Mm -hmm. I remember being introduced kind of gradually to the idea of abortion. First, it was safe, legal, and rare. Mm -hmm. And then it would like it went into my body, my choice. And then it went into all of these other kinds of phrases and more exposure to what abortion is. And now we're at the point where the abortion pill is just being mailed mm -hmm. to girls. And it's this desensitization mm -hmm. to these really graphic, violent topics. And this is something that you talk about in the film in the very beginning this mere exposure effect where kids are exposed to these values and to these ideologies mm -hmm. from a very young age, but it starts gradually, right? Can you talk a little right. bit about that? Yeah, and I, it's not just our kids, it's us too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mere exposure effect uh, originated in Hollywood. I mean, that is the power of media to influence perceptions and culture any which way, even politics, any which way that they want it to go whoever's pulling those puppet strings behind the curtain. And, you know, Robbie and I have unique insight into this coming from that world, you know, me coming from the entertainment world and him coming for, or music world and him coming from the entertainment world. Right. Um, you know, he's directed some of the biggest stars. He's worked with every major studio. Um, and, you know, for people don't, who don't know his story, you know, he lit his career on fire at the top of his career and, you know, to stand up for our values. And so we had insight into how perceptions are changed, how there's literally offices for Planned Parenthood in Hollywood at some of these studios so that they can integrate their views into children's shows, into teenager shows. So there's even, you know, our government has some offices as well. So they have perceptions they want um, to be portrayed uh, into the mass public. Ideas, you know, sometimes people say there's predictive programming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the this, this suggestibility through media, because we're in a trance state, our mm -hmm. mind is not really thinking critically when we're in an entertainment position. Consuming. Yeah, we're consuming, we're being entertained. We're not critically analyzing stuff. So the idea with the mere exposure effect is the more you are exposed to something, the more you are likely to prefer it. So it could be a terrible idea. It could be horrible. It could be abortion. And the more you're presented with it, the more you see your favorite character get an abortion, 
or because she was raped and it's this extreme situation, the more you identify and empathize and, oh, well, maybe it is okay, but they don't tell you what abortion is, you know? So these little things are, are seeds planted in kids' minds when they start with the kids' shows. Mm. And a lot of the way they do this with kids' shows that I've noticed raising three children is they get these kids' shows that seem so sweet and innocent and benign. And that trust factor is there. So now we're bonded to Hollywood. We're, we're bonded to entertainment programming to some extent. And that goes back to our childhoods where Mickey Mouse was part of our childhood. Disney was part of our childhood. And we have that emotional bond and we want to carry that on with our children. And then when we start seeing things like for what they are and, and the ideas and how we've been manipulated, we're like, oh, this is not a good thing. We need to be more discerning. But most people don't realize that this is a real psychological phenomenon, the mere exposure effect. It's been used on us for a long time, and it is still used every single day in advertising. Um, you know, if I ask people this, what, what you know, artist did, have you found that wasn't suggested to you? What show have you found on your own that wasn't suggested to you? That's, yeah, that's hard. What food product you know, yeah. or makeup product that wasn't suggested to you? Yeah. Everything was, has been suggested to us. Yeah. But who's doing that curating and suggesting? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and then I think about a lot of the recent Disney shows or movies where the main character has a gay storyline or a gay romance interest or whatever it is. And it's just it's part of just planting the seed and everything that the kids are watching. And then there's that really popular YouTube channel, Miss Rachel. Have you heard of Miss Rachel? No. She's she's uh, caters to kids much younger than yours. So it's probably not something that, you know, your kids would have seen. But she does these YouTube videos for toddlers that she started, babies and toddlers, that she started during the pandemic. And she made millions, like millions. I think she was a former teacher and she uses a lot of like speech therapy tactics to teach kids about sounds and letters. And she talks really like this and she's like talks cute and she wears <laughs> overalls and she's, you know, yay. My husband can't stand her voice. <laughs> we, The few times that we put on YouTube for my daughter when she was a little bit younger, we found a Miss Rachel video and she was into it. But then I, I, I was like, let me just look this girl up online. She and her husband were from the Broadway circuit in New York. And they hired a non-binary person to do some music for her show, for her segment. There's there like a whole segment of this non-binary person singing children's songs. And that person was on the website. And then I was like, let me go look at this YouTube channel that I went on. the, And there are multiple videos on her channel that include just like a five minute segment of this, mm -hmm. quote, non-binary person mm -hmm. who is singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I'm like, this is how mm -hmm. they just start to introduce the idea of right. like pronouns mm -hmm. and and gender theory to little toddlers. Right. Like a two year old toddler is being exposed to the idea that somebody is not is neither male nor female. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is crazy. And then you really step back and you take a, a bird's eye view of all of the TV shows and movies that are doing this. It's mm -hmm. really frightening. Yeah, it, it totally is. And they, it's almost like a bait and switch because parents will be like, okay, is this okay for my kid? They'll watch one or two episodes. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed a pattern with this. They don't do it in the first two episodes. They eventually like start unrolling more of agendas and right. things like that, you know? Um, I, I mean, there's countless shows where I would let my children watch them and then we'd get to like episode six and I'd be making dinner and then I hear them being like, oh, he's a robot. He doesn't identify as anything. And I'm like, a robot? What? I thought we were watching a tech show about robots. Where, where did this come from? So they will slip it in any way they can because there is an agenda, you know, and, and that's what parents... I think don't understand is they wait till something bad happens like I did. I didn't yeah. do my research before. I just assumed it was about robots. How could we veer into that gendered, you know, area? But, you know, we're, we're at a place now where instead of just waiting to see like what bad product or bad business, like we need to be more proactive and just deciding what we want mm -hmm. from a positive place instead yeah. of avoiding all these bad things like skincare this is a great you know company you know whatever it is for children's shows like bent key has a great you know kids program as well where you don't have to worry about those things it takes the stress off when you are actually mm -hmm. actively seeking out like-minded shared value companies because prager U has a kids yeah like a kids thing now too right? yes i should look into that because mm -hmm. we don't i mean with with my daughter we don't really show her much tv unless she's like at grandma's house on the weekend but mm -hmm. we're always looking for different things to show her because right. she my my mom showed her Blippy, 
Mm-hmm. Have you heard of Blippy on YouTube? I don't uh, know yes, much about him. Yes. Is he? I don't. I don't Blippy, know. Blippy. Okay, so Blippy freaks my husband out. Okay, my <laughs> husband hates him. Well, that's too. probably not a good sign. <laughs> um, but okay, so apparently he was arrested for like defecating in public or something like i don't want to get this wrong but stop you can fact check me i'm pretty sure some something weird involving something weird like right, that like exposing right or pooping or something something weird okay happened there um so i'm just like very guarded of just men in general who want to dress up for children i don't know that's exactly maybe what my husband a common said. denominator that's I what don't Adriano know. said. He said, Why? it's weird. It's weird that a man wants to dress like this. And then one time we were at my mom's house and my mom just put on like a blippy video. My mom wanted to show my daughter like a dentist video mm-hmm. because she's like, soon you're going to have to take her to the dentist. Maybe let's show her like a positive dentist right. video. And she just happened to put on a blippy video. And my dad, <laughs> grandpa goes, <laughs> These guys are freaks. We need to dress up for kids like that. They're freaks. And my husband was like, yeah. So I oh, I laughed. But there is something to that, right? It's right. like, it's kind of weird. Yeah. When you see Miss Rachel, like she kind of makes sense. She's mm-hmm. she's a mom of a toddler and mm-hmm. she like taught kids or whatever she did before. Right. But it is kind of weird, isn't it? It is weird. So it's maybe a, the husbands yeah. are onto something. <laughs> yeah, it, there really is something to that. And, and you know, Baby Shark, I think it's called. Yes. It's like the Baby Crack Show. What is it called that YouTube? Oh, channel. Coco Melon. Coco Melon. Okay. Yeah. Coco Melon is the devil. Yeah, we never put that one on. Because- oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's not even because that I'm aware of of like any of the gender ideology or anything like that. Even though they did start that. Did they, they did start oh, like a gay gosh. a oh, gay storyline or something. Wonderful. Of course they did. Yeah. But like the the tension span, you know, that they literally have an algorithm like a you know, a, yes. a system where they will change the shot every like I don't know, 10 seconds to train the kid's brain right. that they need that constant stimulation. If you take it away, they'll literally have a crying breakdown because yeah. their brain is being trained to have that need that high level of constant stimuli. That's right. I, there was Isn't somebody, my, my friend sent me a video. They were explaining how quickly the frames change. Yes. And then you look at something because my daughter was really into Winnie the Pooh for mm-hmm. the, like the last year. She's over it now. But we had a Winnie the Pooh birthday party for her for her second birthday. And we would show her Winnie the Pooh and you see the difference. These sort of classic traditional Mm -hmm. TV shows for kids. It's much longer frames. Yeah. It's much more calm. Mm -hmm. And the colors are even a little bit more muted. They're Mm -hmm. sort of the, you know, more beige, Mm -hmm. brownish colors. And it's just the story of a little, little bear who's Mm going to go eat honey and Piglet's going to come along. And then Cocomelon is like, (laughs) and it's like crack. And that's why they call it like crackamelon or whatever it's called. It really is. It's crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's not only these children's shows and, and, and uh, movies that are showing these kinds of ideologies. In your film, you also talk about how a lot of major companies are required to do these sort of LGBT inclusion like programs or to like to teach these ideology these companies like what is going on here with a lot of these major corporations right well you know social impact scores are are being you know uh, enacted on these major corporations so in order for them to have good standing with their shareholders and um, you know other vested interests they have to have meet a certain criteria and usually it's you know I think three things like you have to do some kind of major thing where you're doing a public event at a football game or, you know, whatever it is, um, okay. to virtue signal that you guys are, you know, you value diversity, equity, and inclusion, the DEI agenda, the religion. And if you don't do that, then there are ramifications for that. And you don't get certain benefits and you don't get to be a part of these, you know, these groups essentially that uh, evaluate you. And those have ramifications like with shareholders and the way that money is controlled, um, because they wow. will, it's now a risk to do business with people who don't have those things, um, and and wow. they're deemed hateful, you know, if, if they're rejecting the DEI agenda. So you know, there it's it, to understand like the connection with these corporations, like people really should watch the interview with D- Justin Danhoff because he's the expert in this of how mm-hmm. they they took over every major institution um, and pushed conservative or just you know any other thought that doesn't align with that. Um, away out of these, you know, corporate C-suites. And so that's how they were able to consolidate control because there is no opposing viewpoint tolerated anymore at these major corporations. Because there's been this question that's tossed around a lot online lately when you see companies like Target Mm -hmm. or even I think Oreo, Mm -hmm. the Oreo brand had some sort of message about LGBT a year or two ago. And people online were asking, why do they do this? Mm-hmm. 
Like, what is the the purpose behind it? Is this making them money? You know, a lot of people were asking the question because I I think that for the most part, I think most Americans are not interested in seeing that kind of stuff no. when it comes to advertisements, stuff on social media. The average American just does not want to see it. Mm-hmm. They want to just buy their Oreos in peace. Right. They want to just eat Ben and Jerry's in peace. They want to go to Target and have right. a normal shopping experience without having mm-hmm. the rainbow pride flag shoved mm-hmm. down their throat. Mm-hmm. So what is the purpose of all of these companies putting out this kind of content? And it makes so much more sense mm-hmm. when you look at it from that perspective because they're incentivized. I mean, it's even more than being incentivized to do so. They're punished mm-hmm. if they don't. That's right. Yes. So it's, you know, ESG, you know, the social and governance you know, is is really about social credit, you know, but in a form of corporate, not just individual social credit. And so they don't care anymore about what the consumer thinks. They don't care about serving the consumer. I mean, obviously, they don't care about our health. They don't care about the yeah. crap they put in our products or foods or plastics or any of that. It's not about serving the consumer anymore. But we grew up in a generation where we, we thought we were being served. We're the yeah. consumer. And if and if they don't do this, then we're not they're not gonna get our business. Well, they know they're still gonna get our business. They know that most Americans are lazy and apathetic and they're still just gonna go about their daily routine. Um, and so they don't fear us. And that that's really what allows this to continue because if people said, Okay, I'm done, I'm not gonna support this company anymore, like the Bud Light, then they start mm-hmm. actually really evaluating things because they can't continue business if half of their you know, consumer base just drops out. And so that's Mm. really, but it's hard to keep up with all the boycotts and and cancel everything, which is why like I'm an advocate for focusing on what you, you know, want, like how you source your milk and your eggs and all of those things. It takes, you know, thousands of dollars each family a month away from these companies. And eventually that will add up if people are doing this on a family level. Yeah, I think unfortunately you brought up such a good point is that Americans are pretty lazy and i think these companies know that Mm -hmm. and they know that for a lot of families like i've never really been a target person Mm -hmm. i guess also i've just never really lived close enough to a target where it's very convenient to go but i remember when people were talking about the target boycott there were a lot of people who were like oh gosh it's really hard for me not to go because it's so convenient Mm -hmm. and you hear this a lot and these companies know that Mm -hmm. because they know that you have these major stores they have pretty much it's a one-stop shop for everything right Right. And Target has done really great branding mm-hmm. and they have all the cute stuff and mm-hmm. the moms love going there and young women love it's going affordable. there. It's right. affordable mm-hmm. and they've got so many different options. And so it is sad that these companies are capitalizing right. on the fact that we we are a little bit too lazy to search for alternatives. Yes. Because it does take legwork mm-hmm. yeah. to find local places, right. to find things that are at an, um, an equal price. Mm-hmm. It does take extra legwork. Yeah. And for a lot of families, I think, especially with the state of the economy right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of families are just exhausted at trying to keep their head above water. Mm -hmm. So they're just they just keep going through the same motions because it's just easier to to stay in the hamster wheel. Right. I you know, I just know that I I think we're moving towards a place where, you know, self sustainability really should and needs to be a goal for many families, not just because of like the national security threats and you know threat to our food supply and all of these things. Um but you know, I think it's really empowering for people to learn how to grow their own food yeah. or to you know support their local farmer because we're going to get to a place where farmers are not going to be able to continue doing business. Um, they're clamping down on farmers. You know, we, we really have to think long game here, not just like yeah. okay, what's easy for me? It's so much easier to just go to Walmart and get all these things and it's mm-hmm. cheap. But like, what do we really need? You know, we really need to examine like consumerism and what do we need for our family to be healthy and happy and survive. Mm-hmm. Um, because now is a time for choosing. Those yeah. types of things have a big impact um, and will make the difference of, you know, whether farmers can survive, you know, whether we can provide for ourselves, uh, especially if there's an emergency or any of that. So I think that it's really time for people to start thinking about those things. Yeah, it is. I mean, even if you see for Canada, for example, mm-hmm. they have these crazy um, rules for dairy farmers if they produce too much milk they're forced to dump the milk out Mm -hmm. like liters and liters and liters and liters of milk, like probably Mm -hmm. hundreds of liters. And the cows just were, had a, they had a great year. They had a great season. And there was a farmer who filmed himself in like his dairy farm and talking about how the Canadian government will come and fine you or arrest you if you don't dispose of all of the extra milk. 
And then you think about how expensive milk is there. And I'm I'm so nervous about stuff like that coming here. Right. So mm-hmm. it's really important to start finding some more local mm-hmm. businesses that you can really support because mm-hmm. I don't, it's it's a scary thing to see. Right. And even just like forcing the mRNA vaccine into livestock now, you know, they're they're not having to um, disclose a lot of that, you know, it. It, which I think that they should. This mm-hmm. recent omnibus bill, the past, um, actually clamps down on cattle farming. On they want to do like a uh, monitoring system of how many cattle. You know, basically the, they just keep hammering down on farmers to regulate, overregulate them, um, to the point where it's like not sustainable or profitable for many of these people. So mm-hmm. it's really important that you know we support them. Yeah. So there was another part in your film I wanted to ask you about because now when we look at public schools, a mm-hmm. lot of things that are happening in public schools have become, have gone viral online. A lot of videos being taken, uh, uh, things being like leaked from the classrooms. So parents think that they're going to find a better education in private schools. But one thing that you guys talked about a lot was the private schools are many of them are inundated just as much with these ideologies as any other public schools because a lot of the teachers that were trained in DEI and critical race mm-hmm. theory, they're going to teach at the private schools. Right. So mm-hmm. how 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 can parents, you know, I know a lot of the conservatives will say, homeschool your kids, mm-hmm. which is a great option for a lot of parents. But I think that we also need to be realistic and and Mm -hmm. understand that not all parents are going to homeschool their kids. Right. And I still think that homeschooling, as great as it is, um, it's not going to be a majority of Americans who are going to do that. Right. So how can parents better choose schools for their kids K through 12? Yeah. Well, there's a couple things that I think are really important to um, make sure that our schools are not taken over by, you know, this woke ideology and government. I mean, this is coming from government. We have to remember that. <clears throat> the educational, the national education standards and the purse strings that are held over our even local public schools um, are very uh, significant. And I really believe that the future of schooling, that's why I support school choice, uh, is moving away from government mandated education. I mean, if there are tax dollars, then we should get them to de- decide what's best for our individual child. Some kids have special needs. Mm-hmm. Some kids um, would benefit at a Montessori. Some kids would benefit at a tech school. Um, I really think that the parents deserve that power back and, and no strings attached school choice. So government's not telling you what you can, what school your kid can go to or you have to do these certain things to go there. Um, I think that's really important for parents to get behind. We're seeing a lot of those school choice bills because that's going to empower parents to have the choice to even send their kids to an alternative private school. Mm. Because if you're in a situation where you can't afford private school and you're forced to be in a failing public school with woke ideology, it doesn't even matter the questions you ask them. You're going to be stuck. Mm. And if you can't homeschool, what are your options? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of getting into a deeper root level of how we, you know, get out of this in the long term. But short term, the, the questions, if you're you know, privileged enough to be able to interview a bunch of different private schools or ask them, do you guys have a DEI office? Do you have um, what, do you, what is your view of gender ideology? What do you teach on that? What is the school's um, you know, standpoint on that? Do you allow boys, biological boys in the girls' bathrooms? Um, do you teach sex ed? Uh, are parents informed if their children are going to be exposed to any literature containing pornographic or sexual content? Mm-hmm. You know, like. Basically, think of every problem or every worry that's ha- that's actually happening, and ask a question directly about that thing. Right. And and they, this is the thing, they are very trained and educated on how to give you a very nice word salad back and say, "Well, we're very committed to tolerance and everybody we're committed." That's getting, always their you know, phrase. It's like this, you know, <laughs> political speak, right? And most parents will go, "Okay, well, that made me feel better," and turn and walk away. But we really have to ask the more specific question. It's a yes or no question. Do you allow biological boys in the girls' bathroom? Like, it's a yes or no question. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's not a, well, it depends on how they identify, or, well, you know, we haven't had that situation. We'd have to think about it. No, if you have to think about it, then it's, it's you know, it's it's clear that it's not going to be a good environment. Yeah. Um, so if they're not willing to protect girls and, and sports and spaces, I mean, that for me would be a hard no out the gate. But then there's the sexual questions. There's, you know, the the educational objectives. It's really important to understand, you know, who's who's providing curriculum. What are their objectives and agendas? Because if it's a public school, they're mostly beholden to these national standards. And mm-hmm. those embed CRT, SEL into the curriculums. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the private schools are endorsed by NAIS and other, you know, four-letter you know, 
academic yeah. institutions yeah. Um, that give them, you know, their prestige and all that. And so in order for those schools to maintain their credentials and their accreditations, they have to do certain things. And some of those criteria involve, oh, we need to have a DEI officer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it might be that that person at the school, you really like the principal and they their personal views don't align, but they have to do those things because they're beholden to those higher education educational entities. Yeah. And another question that parents have to ask is, because it's something that I've I've seen family members, they work in school systems where if a student changes his or her name and pronouns, the school staff, the teachers are instructed to not inform the parents. Mm -hmm. There's like a policy. So I have a family member who works in a very nice private school in New York. And they tell me how when a, when a student changes their name and gender, the principal sends out an email to every teacher that has that student in class, sends an email to the head of IT to change everything in the system and says, so-and-so now goes by Alice mm-hmm. and the pronouns are now whatever the new pronouns are. Please refer to this student with this new name and pronouns. But if you speak to this student's parents, please continue to use Mm -hmm. the previous name and pronouns. So they are intentionally hiding Mm -hmm. the fact that a lot of these students at school are now being involved in these different ideologies, literally changing their name and changing their pronouns. And they're hiding it from the parents. Mm -hmm. So we have to start asking these questions before you send your kids there yes. because they have to they have to answer like the, what's your policy right if if a student mm-hmm. it, let's say if if my child mm-hmm. changes his name and pronouns mm-hmm. like what's your policy on that right are you or is that something that you and the staff are going to hide from me or are you right. going to let me know yep and then one of the things that like i said earlier conservatives are so into homeschooling now which is fantastic but i think one of the mistakes is that so many people on the right are like just throwing their hand, throwing throwing the towel, throwing the towel in. They're like, whatever. Public schools are over. Just take your kids out of public schools. Mm-hmm. It's done. It's mm-hmm. over. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think we need to be fighting still. Mm-hmm. Because although there are a lot of us who can afford to send our kids to private school or who can homeschool, you have to think about a lot of these kids that come from really unfortunate circumstances. Mm-hmm. And their only option is public school. Right. Do we really want all of those kids to suffer through mm-hmm. whatever is happening in the system right now. I think that we need more right. parents who are still fighting to change the public school system, to change yeah. what's going on in these school boards. Even like how Matt Walsh, mm-hmm. his kids are all homeschooled. Mm-hmm. And was it last year he went to like school board meetings and mm-hmm. he was expressing his his concern and his right. disappointment yeah. at how these schools are being run and people were criticizing right. him and they're like, why are you there? Your kids are homeschooled. He's like, my tax dollars are going here. That's right. Right. And because I care mm-hmm. about other people's kids, because right. you, you think about kids that are just born into these horrible circumstances, mm-hmm. maybe a parent passes away or mm-hmm. abandons them and they have one single working parent who has to work right. three jobs mm-hmm. and they have nobody. And so they have to go to public school. What about those kids? Right. If no one's going to care for them, I think it's we need to think more about how it's it's our responsibility to mm-hmm. care for these kids in our community. And I think we have to fight harder for our public school systems. Yeah, absolutely. I think that where people can still fight, I mean, they should. I mean, th- these are the kids in our community. We have to fight. And, and where we don't have school choice passed, that is the nature. We still have these government-run schools. And so those battles are definitely worth having. Um, but, you know, I do feel very strongly about the school choice thing because it, there's mothers that we know we've spoken to and in, in – in, in our research with school choice to understand, you know, the benefits and the risks and all that. And there's women living, you know, single moms or just in, in living in poverty and their kid is trapped in a failing public school yeah. and they're not going to change things. And no matter what advocating the mom does, um, she, that kid is stuck, you know, in, in a crappy thing just because of their zip code and because, you know, affordability. And so the school choice really empowers the parent. And that's how it should be. Like, why why are we even questioning the government getting to decide what's best for our children? You know, we don't co-parent with the government. They shouldn't get to decide what's best for your child or what's best for my child. Mm. Um, so if there was more choices, there'd be more competition. And those schools, failing schools that had woke ideology that was not popular or wanted by parents would not survive. Mm. That would in, empower and the other schools that were teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, and were going back to tradition um, and where parents didn't have to worry about indoctrination, those schools would be full. 
And that would incentivize more schools to open that were doing those same things. So it has a ripple effect because you have bad ideas that fail, the schools will be closed. Mm. You have good ideas, there'll be even more businesses and, and schools opening. And I think that's you know, a brighter future of getting to choose what's best for that child and having options, many yeah. different types of schools. Right, yeah. And it is it is sad that so many kids, they just have the one option. Yeah. And that's it. And it kind of breaks my heart sometimes when I see people on the right. And I know it's because we're frustrated and it's upsetting, but they're just like, whatever, let the public schools burn. I'm yeah. Like, no. Right, no. We can't do that. These are kids. And, yeah. And a lot of, the, and assuming that the parents a lot of them want this. They don't. They don't have an option. Yeah, they don't <laughs> so have an option. So it's really important to think about that. And is, if we care yeah. about the future of our country, mm-hmm. these, are, these kids are the future of our country. I mean, right. they're going to grow up and start running things. And yep. we, we want them to be well-equipped. We don't want them to be right. full of critical race theory. Yes. And it's not just a, me- a matter of differing of opinions. It's, it's abuse. I mean, when you're yeah. sexualizing a child and giving them pornography... <sighs> that's abusive when you're telling them that you're supposed to lie and keep secrets from your parents that your parents are dangerous yes that's abusive it is. so we're talking about abuse here in a lot of these schools not just a oh well they believe in this ideology so it's it's much deeper than that yeah i think that's a really great point we need to care more about these kids that mm-hmm. are being abused in these systems and being taken advantage of and used as pawns yeah. in the political game that yeah. they're doing right now right and yeah. ending up mutilated in yes. many cases as a result. Yeah, you you interviewed mm-hmm. um, a girl who had a double mastectomy and you talked in the film how they sanitize a language and they call it top surgery. Mm-hmm. And I think it was such a good point because when you hear influencers or celebrities who are getting these, they call it top surgery. Mm-hmm. It's a double mastectomy. Yeah. And this girl had it done when she was like 14? A month after her 13th birthday. Oh my god. Or a week gosh. after, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Right. Still a child, you know, and, and, and that's what's so mind boggling too. And, um, you know, I hope we get to release the full length interview of that mm-hmm. because it was so powerful. And I don't remember if this actually made the cut or not. Um, but it, she was talking about her eating disorder and, and, you know, most of these children have, uh, Co- comorbidities right of other course. mental health issues yeah. or they're on the spectrum yep. um or sexual trauma you know yep. many of the ones that i've worked with have sexual trauma uh and so she was talking about her eating disorder and she in her mind a double mastectomy would the first thing she said i wanted to do after that was go weigh myself because after cutting off my breasts i would weigh less and when, oh man i just have chills like thinking about that like that, that's a child a sick child's mindset you know, a child who has an eating disorder that needs to be treated. Now, if that doctor said, yeah, we'll get you liposuction, most people will be like, that's horrible. That's wrong. You know, when that's you don't give a child liposuction. You teach them to love their bodies and to eat healthy and, and to improve their mindset and get them the help they need. But they did that with gender. You know, they made this about gender and they didn't actually treat her eating disorder. They didn't ask her the, r- the right questions. They didn't get, you know, ongoing therapy that she needed. They fast-tracked her on the the hormones and then the surgery. So, you know, and this is really interesting too because before kids even have a sexual identity, right? Kids are not supposed to have sexual identities. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to be kids. And then when they get to be older, that's when they really figure that stuff out. And, And they're eliminating that natural, you know, sexual development completely by giving them puberty blockers and making those decisions before their bodies have matured or before they even have a chance to, you know, have that sexual maturity take place, Mm -hmm. which is going to be ruined the rest of their life. Yeah. Very, very unfortunate that I think in the future, we're going to see a lot of these kids grow up and there's going to be a lot of really terrible consequences. Abigail Abigail Schreier has talked about this, predicting that there's going to be a a high rate of lawsuits Mm -hmm. against doctors and parents And even worse than that, a lot more mental health issues and suicidal ideations and Mm -hmm. God forbid a lot of these kids act out on it when they're adults later because you hear about the experiment of John Money Mm -hmm. and those two twin boys and then they both ended up dying Mm -hmm. early in their adulthood. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, yeah, and and that's why we need to care more because we're talking about the future of our our culture here and other countries are laughing at us. Right. They're Mm -hmm. laughing at us like... China and Russia, they're laughing. They think this is like funny Mm -hmm. that we're aiding in the destruction of our own society by putting kids through this when they're so young. And then 
the left has the audacity to say that it's all a conspiracy theory and mm-hmm. there are no kids getting top surgery. There are no minors getting right. top surgery. Mm-hmm. I could probably think of at least seven or eight stories that I've mm-hmm. heard recently. Yeah. Just of people, that, of teenagers themselves coming forward and being like, yeah, I had top surgery when I was 15. Right. It's like, oh my gosh. Right. I remember, I don't know, again, I can't remember my own film. Um, <laughs> there was a lot we had in there. So many edits and so <laughs> many hours. Like, But uh, the conversation with the board member of GLSEN, um, I said, do you, do you not believe something such as detransitioner? Like, they will not even acknowledge that they exist. Yeah. Then they're saying, oh, they weren't actually trans. You know, like they just throw them out and they're discarded and they don't have any healthcare resources or no, nobody will fix, you know, their thing. You can get insurance to cover your double mastectomy at 13, but you can't get them to fix the pain and the, the oozing and any of those issues afterward. That's going to come out of pocket. Oh. My gosh. Um, we mentioned John Money, and there was another figure that came up in your film, Alfred Kinsey, who was, who is now known to be a leading uh, sex psychologist. Is that, is that his? Well, he's, yeah, he's deceased now, but he is, you know, the father of modern sexuality. Right. You know, and so. The Kinsey he, he still scale. revered. Yeah, he's still revered. And he has an institute dedicated to him at University of Indiana with a giant statue. Uh, we reached out as part of this film process to ask them for comment on, you know, his infamous tables where he abused children, you know, as young as five months old. Um, h- horrific documentation of, of rape. And, and it, you know, people should really be aware of that and look those up. Um, but it was interesting. They they just negated, like they just denied that that was a thing, that that was evidence. They did not, they didn't, they said that's a conspiracy theory. This is made up and it's well documented. I mean, it's literally in their own books. I went in, um, to a li- the library locally and checked out a book that was, I think, published in the 80s and it literally has the tables just in there. Table. So they they just are outright lying and denying it, you know? So it, it's my hope that in my lifetime, we see the Kinsey Institute shut down and that statue come tearing down because his work set the precedent for views today about sexuality and that children are sexual from birth right and it's those views that are the most destructive and enable gender ideology because there's no parameters you know if if everybody if sexual from birth then there is really no right or wrong because then you're entitled to your sexual expression yes and he also uh claimed that there's no such thing as good sexuality or bad sexuality it's it's just it's essentially just about pleasure like whatever you enjoy yep exactly and then he also had a really big influence on the prominence of hugh hefner Mm -hmm. right yes that was something that i found to be i I never heard that before yes so he called him his pamphleteer so it was you know essentially carrying out his propaganda into hollywood and if you notice that you know, he has the bow tie. Yep. That is, Kinsey was infamous for his bow tie. Bow tie. And so the the Playboy Bunny has that little bow tie on there. They're like that connection, it's just like right in your face. Um, but Playboy, around the time that was introduced, you know, this was like changing the way that families dynamics were playing out, you know, int- mainstreaming like lust, mainstreaming sexual, you know, depravity and making it okay to commodify women, all of those things. So yeah. that was like a big shift. And Kinsey pioneered that and instructed him. Actually, it was uh, Hugh Hefner was a virgin at the time that he met Kinsey. So this was, so <laughs> Hugh Hefner was essentially groomed into being his pamphleteer in Hollywood and carrying out this agenda to mainstream it using what? the mere exposure effect. Mm. And now it's, of course, sexuality just becomes so perverted everywhere you turn. I mean, I was watching, it was a clip on Twitter of this guy. Have you heard of the Whatever podcast? Yes. Yeah, you yeah. See, that's like, they have all the viral <laughs> clips. But there was this guy on there who said that, you know, a lot of marriages, sex dies out. And it's not always the fault of the woman. Sometimes it's not because she's old or unattractive or gained weight. He said it's because a man has trouble uh, getting sexually aroused for a person that he loves. And so then he started to explain the (laughs) the Madonna whore complex, Mm. which is a a term that I actually remember from a Sex and the City episode Mm -hmm. from like probably 20 years ago, where they would joke that Charlotte, the character, her husband struggled with impotence. And she said, oh, it's a Madonna whore complex. He can't get aroused for me because I'm not like sexual enough. I'm his wife. And so this guy was talking about this theory this theory in psychology that 
men cannot get sexually aroused for uh, the mother of their children and their wife because they just simply love her too much. And they have to be able to <laughs> objectify a woman in order to perform sexual acts on her and have a robust sex life. And I'm like, this is so perverse. <laughs> what we like, and a lot of people in the comments were like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this theory, this isn't about, you know, porn brain. This is about how men have always been. And I'm like, we have gone so far down this hole of what sexuality is. And and we're, what we're going to see, what we're already seeing is a future generation of people who cannot approach marriage and intimacy in a healthy way mm -hmm. because they have been so riddled with all of these theories and sex psychology and just the perversion mm -hmm. of sex that's happening in our culture. And it starts from such a young age now. Right. I, I feel so bad, you know, especially for young women. I, I was talking to one young woman in college age and she's like, I just want to find a guy that doesn't want to choke me, spit on me, come on me. Like, it, it, you know, just to have a normal sexual relationship like that will have it doesn't want weird stuff like that. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even fathom that like, that's what girls in college now are dealing with. Like you either have to want that and be pornified and be objectified you know, to keep a man or you're, you're, you're having trouble finding anyone. You know, it's, it's, I mean, what it's done to our culture is so destructive and, and gross. And, you know, I, I just think about masculinity and like, think about like for hundreds of years, a man had no problem looking at a beautiful female body and becoming aroused. Like that's in the DNA to be attracted to a woman. Now, it doesn't matter who's sitting in front of them. If it's not like a voyeuristic or sadistic or objectifying experience, yeah. that's really like the root of it is there has to be some sort of weird thing. Like you need Kink. to be wearing a furry hat. You know, like it's just like these weird things because so they can't literally derive joy from the simplicity and the yeah. beauty of a woman's body. Right. That's not about sex. That's about masculinity mm. and that, that root attraction. You know, eventually you'll get to a place where you want men or you'll want multiple people or furries or whatever or children. Yeah. You know, it's it's really about your sexuality devolving. Yeah. And we, I think one of the first episodes you and I ever did, you talked about how these predators, mm -hmm. these child predators, we often think that they're like born sickos. They're just like born really depraved people. It's a lot of times it's not that. It's it's like they become so desensitized to quote, and I'm putting in quotes, regular mm -hmm. sex. Right. They're watching so much of it online. Yep. And then they need something a little bit more than it's like multiple people. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, gets into these kinks. And mm -hmm. then it's not enough. The dopamine hit is not yep. enough. It's just not enough to reach that climax. Right. And so they have to keep going down this mm -hmm. dark and perverse road until they end up being a, a complete predator and pedophile. Right. Absolutely. And this is what's happening to young men too. So, you know, like hearing that story of a college girl saying that it's not only is it harmful to young women, mm -hmm. but it's just harmful to men too. It is. It it's, really is. It's totally unhealthy for young men to mm -hmm. have this approach to intimacy. And then you think about the declining rates of marriage. Mm -hmm. Of course, like why would a young man who has had his brain riddled with porn want to get married and just have sex with one woman for the rest of his life. Right, absolutely. Yeah, they've been indoctrinated to think and, I mean, biologically too, to, to feel that that's the only way to derive pleasure. Yeah. You know, is from that that voyeuristic place, you know? And it's, it's interesting too, the permissiveness around like not judging, right? Like don't judge kinks and don't judge. But some of these kinks involve asking a woman to dress like a child. That's not a kink. You have a pedophile fantasy. Run. Women should run if a man asks you to do that. They have a pedophile fantasy. That's not a kink. That's a pedophile fantasy. The same thing with the adult diaper community. You know, there's this massive community. You wouldn't even want to know how many people are doing this where they are baby playing. They're reverting back to a baby and they're deriving sexual pleasure Ew. from the most disgusting Stop. stuff. And yeah, and, and, and people that were, were joking about, you know, covering it in the news, like, oh my gosh, they opened a diaper spa. I think it was in New Hampshire or something. Isn't this funny? It, no, it's not funny. It, this is pedophilia. People wanting to have sex and to interact with each other as babies. Like, this is not a fetish or a kink. We should be judging this. We should be saying this is disgusting, wrong. These people are sick. This is not a sexual kink. This is the problem with tolerance. Yep. Live and let live, tolerance. Yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't hurt you, that's the problem with it. That's right. I think we need to return back to normalcy. We need to 
be comfortable with identifying that some things are normal and many things are not. Yeah, and not and okay. okay. And it's, it's not okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's that's not okay. Like if you want, if you have that desire, then what is it ultimately you want? Yeah. You want a child or do yeah. you want a woman? Right. Like it, it's just, it's very disturbing how much fantasy, and if you look at like the porn hub or just porn in general, the analytics of what's searched out. It's a lot of childlike stuff. Like why why do you need a woman holding a teddy bear acting like like things like that? And people will excuse it and say it's role play. No, role play is still an action. You are still physically having a reaction to that action. Yeah. It is not role play. It's not a fantasy. It is real. When you are ejaculating to a child sex doll, it is a real experience, even though that might not be a real thing, you know, or a real person in you're interacting with. It is a real experience. And once yeah. you normalize those behaviors yep. and that person's sick mind, it becomes normal and they need more, like you said, to maintain that level of high or, or normalcy. Oh, and then he's society to say things like, well, you do you, boo. You do you, boo. That's the worst right? phrase ever. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it, it, it's the problem of tolerance. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. I think that we need to be, it sounds harsh, but I think we need to be much more intolerant these days mm -hmm. because a little bit of, a little bit of intolerance would have gone a long way 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And I think would have stopped a lot of what we're seeing today. Oh my gosh. Because yes. it's, it, I don't think people understand the ripple effects. It's affecting when it affects the individual, a young man or a young woman, then that's mm -hmm. going to affect the way that they get married or don't get married one day. It's going to affect their family. It's going to affect the family structure of mm -hmm. our society. And that's the bedrock of any mm -hmm. thriving society. And it's all by design. Right. It's all intentional. Right. To, hi to hide our values too. Because mm -hmm. like anytime we rear our head with our values and say that's wrong, every most people are, are still scared, you know, of that. Yeah. blowback of like oh well you're you're a christian or you're anti this and you're intolerant because you have your own views but yet they're allowed to have their extreme radical views and yep. you're not allowed to have an opinion or say anything back yeah. it's it's wild because because rolling stone just did a hit piece on you too right yes yeah so rolling stone's just been known for their hit piece they did a hit piece on evie magazine they're just going after anyone who's remotely on the right these days but yeah. what did they say about you in the film they went after the film i mean it's interesting because they they didn't say anything about the film. Like, it was unassailable factually, yeah. the stories, the people. Like, they couldn't actually attack the film. So they had to get into these, like, ticky-tacky ways of how, you know, our our team outreached to the people. And, you know, the, the, the film name changing, things like that, which, you know, if you're in the industry, you understand, like, this is industry standard. Names change, projects <laughs> change, directors change, you know. And that was the case. This was no different. Um but they they were saying that it was misleading and they didn't feel safe and you know all of these things and it's just interesting and I told Robbie we should release the full length of the the drag interview because we were nothing but respectful um, in all of our interactions from our team making outreach to you know the experience in fact the uh, one of the moms who is the I guess gender non raising a gender nonconforming child or um, she actually when she left the interview said she was, these were the most amazing questions. I felt so comfortable, you know, thank you for walking me into my car. Like, you know, this was such an amazing experience. Thank you. And then right after she found out who we were, was like, take my name off this. I don't want to be a part of it. Like freaked out on our our poor assistant who was just like, she's so sweet. And she was handling this and just cussing her out and telling her, you know, I'm going to lawyer up, like all these things. I'm like, wow, that was a very different, you know, reaction <laughs> simply because you're apparently not allowed to, to have conservative views and be an interviewer. Right. You're only allowed to do it if you are LGBTQ yeah. or on their side, you know, and that's not how art, film, documentaries work. No. You know, we, we, we can have a seat at the table too. Yeah. And it was not about our views. It was about objective reality, facts, and the people's stories. Yeah, you guys got a lot of really good interviews in there. A lot of, some of them I was shocked they even agreed to it. <laughs> but it's great that they did because it shows a lot of different sides. Right. And it was an opportunity for them. It wasn't yeah. a gotcha. It no. was literally like, hey, here's your opportunity. I went into that thinking the drag queen was going to be like, yeah, no, I'm not okay with that. Right. And then we can have some sort of understanding. But he just buckled down and was like, nope, and didn't want to see any of the other videos. And I'm like, we have countless videos of children being subjected to these sexually explicit shows. You, why is it so hard to denounce that? Yeah. It's a very, we could move on from now. And like, even, just say that. Even if you don't, if, if you are so comfortable with it, if that mm -hmm. person is comfortable with it, then why 
Why, th- why don't they want it played? That's right. Why don't they want to discuss it? Because it's, yes. for me, for something that I believe in, mm-hmm. for example, I have no problem discussing being anti-abortion. Right. I got no problem discussing it. That's right. I'm not going to run away yeah. from an interview with someone who is pro-abortion mm-hmm. or, quote, pro-choice just because we disagree on something. Right. So if, if you are truly comfortable with it, mm-hmm. I don't understand why you can't just sit and have a conversation about it. That's right. Because right. you guys were being respectful. Absolutely. Like nobody attacked him or anyone in, in this whole process and said names or anything like that. Like that's just not how we operate. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear if you watch the film, it was very respectful. Yeah. And these are just normal questions. Like there is no like accusatory. It was just, do you support this? Is this okay? Yeah. You know, I mean, these are basic questions that, that they can't answer without crying victim. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the simple question of, do you agree with this? Is this mm-hmm. okay in mm-hmm. your eyes? They can't even answer that. No. Because they know deep down it's not okay. I know. And 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 I could feel that. Like he had a visceral reaction, like, oh great. You know? Right. But he just couldn't. He, I mean, and it could have been over really quick, like, hey, yeah, I'm a drag performer. I do drag for adults. I'm not okay with this. Yeah. And let's move on. Yeah. Like <laughs> there have been drag queens online who have said that. Yeah. They're like, I like what I do, but it's for adults, it's not for kids. Right. And I think it's inappropriate for kids. Right. It's pretty easy to say that. Right. But you know, they're almost... apparently it's not anymore. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, well, this has been really great, Landon. Thank you for taking the time. Why don't you tell everybody where they can watch The War on Children? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always amazing to see yeah. you. Um, they can go to thewaronchildren.com and watch the film there. There's many ways to watch it. You can also gift the film to people who might be reluctant to uh, pay for it yep. themselves but who need to see it. Yep. Um, and then also I wanted to mention, you know, my nonprofit, Freedom Forever, I wrote a parenting revolution manual and it is free. So when you subscribe, at freedomforever.us you have a parenting revolution manual sent to you and that is really like the answer to what do we do after you watch the war on children and it's overwhelming and you don't know where to start I outlined every step a parent needs to take, ways to to change their, you know, home dynamics, school, everything that they need to think about and do to really have a revolutionary response to this war on children. Yeah, that's, I gotta download that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, everybody, please go watch this film. It is, um, it's very eye-opening, especially for parents, but I think it's important for everyone to know what's going on. You don't have to be a parent to find some substance out of this film. I think it's better to arm ourselves with information, to understand what's really going on. And especially if you know you want to have kids one day, it's important to to understand what is being fed to them by our culture and society and by these mainstream machines that it sometimes feel like we have feels like we have no control over. But we do have we, we do have our voice and we do have a way to push back. And I think that it's it's working. I think a lot of people pushing back against these values and speaking up about against these ideologies, it is making ripple effects. So we just have to keep pushing. Absolutely. We have to keep delivering this kind of content. So thank you for coming. Thanks I'm so sure much, we'll do Gina. this again soon. And thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you next time. Don't forget to follow Landon and subscribe to my channel too. I forgot to say that at the beginning. I always forget to say that. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye.